Welcome to the Masculine Psychology Podcast, where we answer key questions in dating, relationships, success, and fulfillment, and explore the psychology of masculinity. Now, here's your host, world-renowned therapist and life coach, David Tien. I'm David Tien, and welcome to the Masculine Psychology Podcast. In the previous episode, we covered the shadow, and we covered why it's more accurate to think of the shadow as a multiple, that there are multiple shadow parts in us. And the second point was how our ignorance of our shadow parts infected every area of our lives, including our dating and relationships, our effectiveness in multiple areas of life, and especially in our long-term happiness and fulfillment. And the third point we looked at were the different types of shadow parts, the most common types of shadow parts that we find in many men. And noticing that if you have a strong emotion of hate against something, that that was often a symptom or a clue or a sign that there is an unexplored shadow part in relation to that thing that we are expending so much energy to push away. And in this episode, we're going to be getting into the two best ways to find, heal, and integrate our shadow parts into our overall psychological system. And I'm excited to get going into this. It's really important that we uncover, understand, and integrate our shadow parts because they are the key to lasting fulfillment and joy and happiness in the long run and experiencing inner harmony and peace, and that sense of ease, as well as our full effectiveness and success in a variety of areas of our lives, especially our personal lives, and anything in any area of our lives that have to do with our emotions. Super important, especially in long-term relationships. In the last episode, I also busted two big myths that are very common. The first one, especially uh, among men who are maybe over-reliant on their intellectual parts. And that's the myth of what you see is all there is. The myth of what you see is all there is. And the shadow, and indeed all of psychotherapy, is about getting into the, the parts of us that we don't see or that aren't on the surface or that are not obvious personas. And if you don't respect that, if you don't respect the power of the unconscious, then you'll always be stuck in inner conflicts, especially as you evolve over time, you're going to hit that ceiling of your growth and you'll be stuck in these places of indecision. And it'll be as if you are a stranger to yourself. You have these conflicts inside you and you don't know how to resolve them. And that's a really painful place to be. You don't want to feel that and be stuck there for a lot of time because it ends up being almost a waste of time being stuck in this kind of impasse and just sort of waiting for some kind of resolution that never arrives. And that's what happens when you buy into the myth of what you see is all there is. And then the second myth that I covered in the previous episode was the myth that the shadow is one thing. And I found this in a lot of the online content about the shadow, the Jungian shadow, and addressing it as if it were the sort of one unitary monolithic thing. It's just the shadow. And I spent a lot of time in the past episode, previous episode, breaking down the Jungian concept of the shadow and evolving that into our modern concepts that we have a much more sophisticated understanding of our psychological parts. And there are shadow parts in an IFS therapy, which is a very advanced modality of therapy. The shadow parts would correspond to our exiles, or our firefighter protector parts that we often banish or disown or have some shame or guilt around and that we hope don't come out. So our day-to-day -day manager parts, which correspond to the Jungian personas, are what we're most familiar with. And we often then just, we conceptualize all of the other parts as just one thing. They're in the shadows, but in fact, they're not. And it's important to realize that we have likely have several, if not dozens, of parts of us that are in the shadows as exiled parts that are holding our vulnerability or as firefighter parts that come in and through extreme reactions, try to deal with the situation of holding back um, triggered emotions. Okay, so before we get much further with exploring the shadow, I think it's important to pause here 
and contrast it with the concept that Carl Jung used to contrast it with, which was the persona. And it's really important to understand what the persona is before we dive in any further in exploring what the shadow is. So in IFS therapy, the concept that corresponds to the persona would be a manager part. But we will stick with, let's just stick with the Carl Jung concept of persona, since that might be more understood or more easily understood uh, without diving into the uh, complexities or intricacies of IFS therapy. So I'm going to quote right out of Carl Jung here, and this is from his book, from his collected works called The Two Essays on Analytical Psychology. Okay, so this is Carl Jung on The Two Essays on Analytical Psychology, and this comes from page 157 in my edition. And this chapter is entitled, The Persona as a Segment of the Collective Psyche. Okay, we don't need to bother about collective psyche right now, but just pulling out his uh, definition of persona. Okay, so the term persona is really a very appropriate expression for this, for originally it meant the mask once worn by actors to indicate the role they played. Okay, so that's where the term comes from as the mask. And then I'm going to skip ahead to his chapter on anima and animus. And these are two different types of uh, the shadow. Okay, so I'm on my version of it is on page 198 of the anima animus chapter. I am of the opinion that it is absolutely essential for a certain type of modern man to recognize his distinction not only from the persona, but from the shadow, the anima as well. For the most part, our consciousness in true Western style looks outwards, and the inner world remains in darkness. And what he's pointing out here is the myth of what you see is all there is. But this difficulty can be overcome easily enough, if only we will make the effort to apply the same concentration and criticism to the psychic material which manifests itself not outside but inside our private lives. And skipping down to the next paragraph, perhaps I can best explain what has to be done if I use the persona as an example. Here, everything is plain and straightforward, whereas with the anima, the shadow, all is dark, to Western eyes anyway. When the shadow, or the anima, continually thwarts the good intentions of the conscious mind by contriving a private life that stands in sorry contrast to the dazzling persona, It is exactly the same as when a naive individual, who is not the ghost of a persona, encounters the most painful difficulties in his passage through the world. There are indeed people who lack a developed persona, blundering from one social solecism to the next, perfectly harmless and innocent soulful bores or appealing children, or if they are women, spectral Cassandras dreaded for their tactlessness, eternally misunderstood, never knowing what they are about always taking forgiveness for granted, blind to the world, hopeless dreamers. From them, we can see how a neglected persona works and what one must do to remedy the evil. Such people can avoid disappointments and an infinity of sufferings, scenes, and social catastrophes only by learning to see how people behave in the world. They must learn to understand what society expects of them. They must realize that there are factors and persons in the world far above them, They must know that what they do has a meaning for others, and so forth. Naturally, all this is child's play for one who has a properly developed persona. The man who over-relies on the persona is blind to the existence of inner realities. What Jung is saying there when he says, naturally, all this is child's play for one who has a properly developed persona, is that in most cases, his clients are those who have a properly developed persona. That is, a persona is useful and helps us get on in the world. And that is, in fact, what manager parts are dedicated to doing. And for Jung, and at that time, uh, when was kind of one of the founding fathers of psychotherapy, the only people who were able to afford private psychotherapy, or like maybe the biggest class of people, are, were the elites. And generally speaking, they had well-developed personas to get on in the world. A lot of men, when it comes to the dating world, especially those who somehow find me, and that might be you, don't have well-developed personas for dating or interacting with women. So that is something that you can look into. Now, in the psychotherapy context, 
mostly what happens is the people who come to psychotherapy are those for whom their their personas crack. And when the mask cracks, it breaks. It no longer is something that they can hide behind. And that the psychic break happens. Then what they are able to find is now they come to their shadow. They can no longer hold it back. They can no longer live in denial of their shadow parts. But sometimes if you don't have a well-developed persona, you might also be ready to get in touch with your shadow parts, but it might be hard for you to get on in the world. Maybe you don't have enough money. Maybe you have a hard time adjusting in your workplace or even just getting a job or interacting with other people or fitting in in society so that you're not able to pay the rent or to pay for the, the therapy or the, the leisure time to invest in yourself and meditate and so on. And it helps to have a, a well-developed persona. So we're not looking down on the parts of us that are not the shadow, just making that really clear. They have an important role in our lives. And for life coaching, a lot of it, actually almost all of it, is directed at helping people get on in life, helping them develop their personas. And in my work as a dating coach, the dating courses, dating skills courses that I provide do help men develop healthy and effective personas for the dating context and in sometimes at work or when they need to be leaders or dominant in life or assertive. And it's important to be able to have a well-developed persona. But if you only see the persona and you think your personas are it, that's all there is to you, and you kind of believe the facade or believe the lie, believe the mask, then what you're doing is you're denying parts of you that are core, central, fundamental, and hold your deepest emotions. Your greatest pain is also connected to your deepest vulnerability, which is connected to your love and your richness of connection and passion and creativity and playfulness and spontaneity and adventurousness and, and excitement and sexuality. And our outward facing personas, the parts of us, the masks that we wear or inhabit, the parts of us that we present to the world are valuable, especially if they're well-developed parts and they are very likely full on managerial parts and they have a role to play, but very likely they are burdened and they might be overworked or very tired or exhausted. By the time you get to listen to this, you very likely reach that point to find me somehow on the internet. And hopefully you're now primed to turn inwards and move away from an over-reliance on your persona. Okay, so as you might have picked up from my quotations from Carl Jung, I believe that one of the best ways to find, heal, and integrate your shadow parts is therapy, specifically parts therapy, and especially IFS therapy. This is internal family systems therapy. And I've done a lot of episodes and videos on IFS therapy. I'm a certified IFS therapy practitioner. I practice many other modalities of psychotherapy, so I don't want to limit it just to IFS therapy because I think there are other modalities that are useful and helpful and effective, like Gestalt therapy, for example, which has a robust theory and protocol around parts, transformational chair work, psychodynamic therapy also has a robust parts analysis and also add in their uh, schema therapy uh, to a limited extent. And many other modalities of therapy can be matched well with or work well alongside of IFS therapy. So it's not exclusively IFS therapy, though, that this is the main modality that I'd recommend people explore if they want to find, heal, and integrate their shadow parts. Now, that's the first recommendation I wanted to point out. I'm giving you two. <laughs> so the first is parts therapy. And what parts therapy will do is to help you discover and uncover those parts of you that have been banished or exiled into the shadows. And it's a challenge. It can be, especially at the beginning, it can be challenging to have the vulnerability and self-awareness to be able to sense into those hidden parts of us. They're not obvious. They're hidden in our unconscious. So there is a process that will help you get better at finding, uncovering, discovering the shadow parts of yourself. And this is going to be an ongoing process as you discover more and more shadow parts. 
Okay, so you discover them. Okay, then what? Then you get to know them. You develop a relationship with them from the perspective of, or from the position of your higher self or your true self. Okay, so this term, the true self, is a term of art. It's a specialized term in IFS therapy. And I've done a lot of content on this. I don't have the time to devote to it completely, but I'm just going to just put it out there, true self, higher self, and hopefully you kind of get an idea of what that means. From your, the perspective of your higher self, you can develop a relationship with these shadow parts. And that's really important because without that trusting relationship, if your shadow parts don't trust you, they're not going to be able to, they're not going to relax into the process and let you lead them. So then things will just get stuck at that first stage of just finding them. And so you build that relationship. And what does that mean? You build a relationship by getting to know their job, or their role, how they got into this job or role. They will very likely show you the early parts of your life when they first started taking on these jobs or roles. And that's for the firefighter parts or the exiled parts. They'll start to tell you how they got these burdens and they'll show you. And when this is the challenging part for many people, the painful traumatic events, they could be micro traumas that are traumatic to children. And they'll show you from the inside what it was like so that you can understand them only when they feel fully understood, will they allow you to proceed in the process with them. So as you discover their burdens, and their burdened roles, and you build that relationship of trust, then you can go through a process of unburdening them, which is healing, and then inviting into them positive qualities that can fill those places where the burdens have left. And then you can go into the step of integrating them into the rest of your parts, into a healthy role in your psyche, into a healthy role in your internal system. Do you struggle in your interactions with women or in your intimate relationship? Are fear, shame, or neediness sabotaging your relationships or attractiveness? In my Platinum Partnership Program, you'll discover how to transform your psychological issues, improve your success with women, and uncover your true self. Get access to all my current and future online courses by applying for the Platinum Partnership today at davidetienphd.com backslash platinum. I use quite a bit of jargon there, as I, I realize, but the jargon is useful because it's like code for much bigger concepts that would take a lot longer to unpack. So hopefully you've heard about IFS therapy through some of my other episodes or content or videos or lives or something like that, or through my courses. So you understand what these code words mean, but um, they're very close to the common sense or the common use of these words of finding, healing, unburdening, and then integrating them. So integration means that I'm just going to say a couple more sentences about integration. Integration means that you don't just unburden them and then just leave them where they are. The healing step, the final healing step of integrating them is finding a new role and a new place and a new relationship that these parts have with your other parts and in your life. Like what's their role in your life? When do they come out in your life? When do they, are they active most? What contexts and so forth? So I'll give some examples of that. Actually, why don't I just do that right now? So we'll give you some examples. Let's take an example of a part that is shadow part that is connected to sexual desire. And as you get to know this part, it might show you a memory when you were sexually shamed as a child. And this is very common that our parents, when they encounter something very explicitly sexual, overreact, get triggered and just go, ah, and then we interpret that as something bad about us or something that we did wrong. You might also have been subject to some kind of sexual abuse. And of course, that would bring sexual shame with it. And what you'll discover as you meet these parts holding the sexual shame and might be in a relationship with sexual desire, which is that, you know, if they're very young, is a kind of curiosity around a kind of innocence and play around sexuality. But it might be parts that came online when you were hitting puberty and didn't have an outlet because of your rigid family, sexual shame, or maybe it's your religion or your society or whatever it is. 
There wasn't a healthy outlet for it. So sexuality was something hush hush, only in the dark, repressed. And because it didn't have a sexual, a healthy outlet, the sexual desire morphed into something that whenever it came out was experienced. This part ended up getting shamed by other parts of you and was called dirty or something like that and was pushed into the shadows. So that's another example of a part that is bearing sexual shame or is feeling that sexual desire that ends up in the shadows. So as you get to know it, you'll discover how it got to be this way, its burdens that it's carrying, how it came to have these burdens. And then as you get to know it and give it your compassion and your connectedness and your courage and your confidence that naturally comes from being in your higher self, in the state of your true self. Then that healing relationship allows these parts uh, that are sexual to unload their burdens of these emotions or beliefs they took on from those traumatic experiences back then. And then they can move into a healthier or maybe a freer place and role in your life and come into the fullness of your sexual uh, comfort, but even more than that, your sexual power or sexual freedom, where now you can really be comfortable with your sexuality and explore healthy sexuality without shame. And that would be an example of integrating the sexual part. Now, it might be really obvious how you'd with like a healthy sexuality and where that would come out in your life, obviously in your sex life, but also in your interactions with the opposite sex in dating or in relationships, but also even in the way that you dress or the way that you talk or move and the way you maybe even the hairstyle that you have, the tone of voice that you have, that now that you're comfortable with your expression of your sexuality, it then colors all these different aspects of you and you appear much more attractive overall and that is because the sexual parts of you have now come into a healthier, fuller role in your life. And that's what happens when you integrate. Now, you could also take a second approach. Now, I'll stay with the sexual parts, sexual psychological parts uh, example. And the second approach, first is parts therapy. The second is a kind of directive coaching or coaching that's more directive. It's giving you direct advice. And you can do them at the same time. So you can have a therapeutic process alongside a coaching process. In fact, I've tested that for several years with my clients and in my online courses. Side by side, giving practical step by step how to guidance, do this, do that, do more of this, do less of that, alongside of the deeper therapeutic process. And I find that to be very effective, especially when the area that you're focusing on, in this case, the example here is sexual psychological parts, are more obvious or well understood. Okay, so in that case, what you could do is if, for example, if you're as a man, you have repressed sexuality. And once you start the process of getting to know those parts of you that are holding the sexual shame or holding the sexual desire that you've been shaming inside, as you get to know those. So in other words, the therapeutic process is now underway. And maybe if you're talking about uh, individual private therapy, maybe 10 sessions in, depends really on your individual background and, and where you start out and all of that. But let's just, for example, let's say 10 sessions in, that's feasible. Then at that point, now introducing some more practical, concrete, specific steps of, for example, getting a fashion makeover, going to a stylist and saying, I'd like to get clothing that is better fitting my body. Because a lot of people who have uh, sexual shame or who shame themselves or the sexual, shame their own sexual parts, dress in clothing that kind of hides their bodies or dress in clothing that helps you just to fit in so that you don't get noticed per se, or that you just have respectable clothing or kind of like the uniform at work type of clothing, but it's not expressing your own individuality and it's not fitted and it's not actually fitting you right from the fashion world's perspective. And in fact, this is the average dude in the US especially, uh, or North America. Generally, the average dude in North America is wearing clothes a size or two too big because they're kind of hiding the sexual shame. They're kind of hiding behind this baggier clothing. So they're taking the attention away from their physical body and more on just the fabric, I suppose, <laughs> itself. And even a really, really nice piece of clothing 
can actually not look good on you just because of the fit. And in fact, if you have an inexpensive item of clothing, like a just a plain white t-shirt, but if it's fitting you correctly, if it's, if it's fitted, then it can look great. It can look as good as a shirt that would be 10 times the price, just because it's fit, it fits right. And that's just an easy, easy example of how you can begin to incorporate the sexual parts of you to, to just kind of communicate to them that they're okay, that you accept them and you're, or you're on the, in the process of accepting them. You start to, to bring in these directive steps to incorporate more of a comfort around your sexuality. Other things you can do is engage in more body movement work, some somatic type of coaching or somatic type of work. And that could be yoga. It could be pure movement. It could be tantra. And these are all ways of coming at it from a more a specific step-by-step -step directive approach. So that's the second approach, directive coaching, the first being parts therapy. And I'll give you two more examples of how this might work out. Let's say you have a shadow parts that are connected to anger. And what that means is you have in some way repressed your anger and you're uncomfortable with anger. And yet you are still drawn to maybe men who themselves are comfortable with assertiveness or, or who are leaders or dominant, the stereotypical alpha male, perhaps in the healthy sense, not the macho posturing type, but just you're connected to or drawn to charismatic men who are good leaders. And you have trouble doing that yourself. That's part of the reason why you're attracted to that type of person as a kind of mentor or role model, but it's hard for you to access that. And then when you see um, anger in others, it makes you feel very uncomfortable, like you don't know what to do. And you want to alleviate the anger, you kind of want to just placate and just everyone stop being angry kind of reaction, because that's what you've inherited. And that's part of the reason why you must have repressed the anger. Okay, so you can start with the parts therapy, and you get to know the parts that are holding probably holding anger and also the parts in you that are afraid of anger. Those are two different sets of parts all in the shadows. And you get to know them and you do the parts therapy process that I've already talked about of finding, healing, integrating, and so on. And once you're underway, it could happen all in the big transformative cathartic or steps can happen in one session, like it can happen in an hour. And then it's an ongoing relationship within you that you build with these parts over time. So that is several weeks, several months ongoing, uh, checking in and seeing how they're doing inside you and your mind. And then of course, through for the rest of your life, because they are valuable parts of you that will grow and shift over time. So once that's well underway, you can also incorporate directive coaching for this. So that might mean that with the angry part, as it's being healed and integrating, it might take on a healthy warrior role. So a part of you that enjoys standing up for your ideals or for values and enjoys physical movement and exertion and might enjoy being a leader and helping others by leading and might enjoy coming into the kind of dominant role in life. And this might even connect to your sexual parts, kind of sexual dominance where you're comfortable taking on those roles in sex of being more dominant. And that might come straight from your sexual parts that might morph into that or grow into that. But it would definitely also come from just integrating the parts of you that were uncomfortable with anger. And now that they are comfortable with anger as just another emotion among emotions and understanding why the anger was there in the first place and so on and not being controlled by it, but being able to bring it up and, and deal with it and endure it and maybe even felt in a constructive way, are now able to be very comfortable in dominant roles of leadership or assertiveness, which is different from aggression. Aggression and aggressiveness is attacking or invading. Assertiveness is defending. It's bringing up the shield to protect innocent parts of you or innocent people or your the ideals or values you, that you value or that you live by. And those are two different energies. And once you're comfortable with those, now the angry parts are now moving into a healthy assertiveness, a healthy dominance, healthy warrior roles. While they're doing that, you know, once the therapy is well underway, you can also do a directive type of approach where you could start to explore martial arts or more 
confrontational type of sports where you're directly facing an opponent and aggression or getting into that kind of warrior energy can really help. And you can actually grow that and become comfortable with it over time. You can train it. You can also do more assertiveness practice and drills. And right? so all of these will become a lot easier and help the process alongside the parts therapy. But the parts therapy ought to come first rather than just going straight into the directive coaching. Because for a lot of people, you can try it. You, you might be able to just get away with going straight to directive coaching and doing parts therapy later on. But uh, I find that a lot of people either end up, uh, if they haven't done the therapeutic work, I end up faking it and just doing it on the outside. But on the inside, they're very uncomfortable. Or they re-traumatize themselves because taking the anger as an example, the, the warrior energy from the outside triggers the memories of whatever unresolved issues from their past. So then it's just they get re-traumatized. So the directive coaching is very effective in the later stages. And here's another example uh, for achievers, any parts that are that are lazy or seen as to seen to be lazy. When you undergo the therapeutic process, you might discover that they are actually really creative and artistic and just only seen as lazy from the perspective of other manager parts that have other goals. But once you get to know them and unburden them of uh, whatever uh, emotions or beliefs they took on from the past that have gotten them stuck in this place of that's painful or um, restrictive, then they, once they are undergoing this healing process, then they might come into their fullness of creativity or artistic endeavor or artistic expression. And you can also help them with directive coaching. So as they're growing through the therapeutic process, you could join an art class or you could explore whatever creative outlet that uh, they've been meaning to. And you'll notice that from the inside. Maybe you're starting to feel this desire to paint or draw or dance or sing or write poetry or stories or whatever it is or songs. Being able to have that outlet early on in the process, once the therapeutic process is underway, then on the outside, exploring creative avenues or channels of expression can be very helpful and useful alongside. So two different modalities, parts therapy, I recommend IFS therapy there, and then a kind of directive coaching where you are feeding these parts, these outlets of, of a healthy expression of the energy they're holding. Okay, so you might think this is too airy-fairy, too woo-woo, and I totally get that, especially if you have ever bought into the myth of what you see is all there is, and you're blind to the power of your unconscious and how powerful your unconscious is and taking care of, you know, 95% or more of, you know, I mean, that's accounting for 95% or more of your brain processing. And right now, keeping you alive, your heart beating, you're continuing to breathe and so on. A lot of things we take for granted, all handled by our brain processing that happens at an unconscious level. Anyway, I get it. If you think it's too airy-fairy or woo-woo, don't worry. Come back to our next episode. The next episode, I'm going to be covering concrete case studies to illustrate what it's like to go through shadow work and what it's like on the other side of it to give you a, some, a more specific, a concrete idea of what it's like. And just to recap, the two best ways of finding, healing, and integrating your shadow parts is first parts therapy, and that should come first, and then a kind of directive coaching. And this is where you're actually taking these steps to you know, specific concrete steps to feed healthy versions of the energy that's being repressed so that they have this healthy outlet of exploration. Okay, so thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for all the feedback I've been getting over all the various episodes and the support. And I really value that. So um, if you have any comments about this one at all, I'd love to know what you think. And also, if you can rate it on Apple Podcasts, that always helps. And if you enjoyed this or any of the episodes, please share it with anyone that you think would benefit. It really would mean a lot to me. And I look forward to welcoming you to the next episode. Until then, David Tian, signing out.